All right. So thank you all for uh, being here this afternoon for what is a special seminar jointly sponsored by the Berman Institute and, and SICE. Um, it's a real privilege to have a, a colleague this evening um, who has such interesting and diverse expertise. Bina Agarwal is a professor of development, economics, and environment at the University of Manchester, where she has been full-time since uh, fall of 2012. She's also a professor of economics at the University of Delhi. You probably have seen the announcement for her talk today, but let me just give you a little bit of background. I don't want to eat too much into her, her time today. But her training is in uh, economics, doctoral and master's and bachelor's level degrees from uh, both the University of Delhi and the University of Cambridge. She works across a very interesting and, I hope for us, provocative set of areas, including, this is my uh, paraphrase, social justice, gender and women's issues, forestry, agricultural policy and practice, economics, and uh, South Asia, and all sorts of interesting combinations of those and more. She has written uh, many uh, articles and award-winning books, and the two maybe most notable, at least in terms of my pointing them out to you, are called The Field of One's Own, Gender and Land Rights in South Asia. Uh, that's a book, a second book, which has just come out in paperback, called Gender and Green Governance, The Political Economy, Economy of Women's Presence Within and Beyond Community Forestry. Um, I would be neglectful if I didn't point out two things. <coughs> one, if you are interested, one of the um, ways we have come to know about Professor Agarwal's work is in her collaboration with uh, Ruth Faden and Yasha Shagai and Sarah Glass, among others, the Global Food Security Project. And she has a paper here that she's uh, offered to share with those who are interested. Copies are up on the front uh, called Principles and Perceptions of the Invisible Hands in Food Security Outcomes. Lastly, uh, Gender and Green Governance has just been published in paperback and will be discussed as part of the Cambridge Festival of Ideas. Festival of Ideas. I wasn't going to get that right, so thank you for filling in the blank. Uh, we are really thrilled to have you here. As you see, we're doing live video conferencing with our colleagues at SICE. They can hear us and we can hear them. I should let everybody in the room know that the microphones overhead are open and live and they will be throughout, so anything you say or any coughs you make will be transmitted in another direction. Um, so, just be forewarned. We're here today to hear Professor Ockerwald talk about food security and the small farmer, the politics and ethics of voice and choice. So thank you, Bina, for being here. It's a real pleasure. And uh, we look forward to your comments. Yeah, hopefully the technology will work. Um, Slides. I'm sure I did, yes. Um, there they are. Can we get rid of the same computer stuff? It'll, it'll. <coughs> it is good. Well, I'm delighted to be here. This is a continuation of a conversation that started especially this March, although earlier on the project, which was at Yale at a conference uh, last year. Um, and uh, also, I want to thank the organizers for organizing such good weather, mm -hmm. along with a bit of heat and a bit of dust. Um, makes me feel very much at home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to talk about questions of food security in the small farmer, the politics and ethics of voice and choice. We know that um, both governments and social movements hold quite divergent views on the future of smallholder agriculture. Uh, you know, one of the, let, let me just preface this by saying, you know, one of the grand challenges today, of course, is how do we feed globally uh, a growing population, 9 billion, by 2050, perhaps more. Um, climate change is another part of that challenge. So the demographic shifts, there's climate change, um, and uh, there's urbanization among uh, a range of global uh, shifts and movements. Now with that background, we find that there is engagement by governments, by civil society, by academics and others, policymakers, on how do we go about 
doing this. Uh, particularly governments and social movements actually have quite divergent views on the future of smallholder agriculture and its role in feeding the world. Now smallholder agriculture is particularly important because in large parts of the world, especially in Asia and, uh, and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the majority of farmers are smallholders. 80% of farmers cultivate less than 2 hectares of land, 70% less than 1 hectare of land. But both these approaches, which is approaches taken by governments and social movements, uh, raise, I'm arguing, a common ethical concern. How much say do the farmers themselves have in deciding their futures? And what restricts their choices? So what I will demonstrate is that often they have rather little choice due to the multiple constraints that they face. And I will also argue that for charting pathways for global food security that are ethically defendable and environmentally sustainable, we will need to create conditions and institutions that respect individual freedoms when defining collective responsibilities. So at the same time, I pose a reverse question, which is also important. What pathways can help individual choices converge towards environmentally sustainable agriculture? It's always easier to ask questions than to answer them, but I will try. So today, what we have is um, two dominant and divergent views about the pathways to a food secure world and the place of the smallholder in that process. Now, one view is that small farmers are a drag on growth and large, typically corporate farms are best placed for a growing urban population. Now, this view supports the idea that there should be have rapid shifts of people from farm to non-farm jobs and from villages to cities. And it's upheld by many policymakers in developing countries, as well as a range of academics and international organizations. Now, China, of course, is the first example that comes to mind when we think of uh, state engineer engineered population shifts from rural to urban areas. They're building very large numbers of cities for this purpose, and uh, using a range of mechanisms for propelling, encouraging, if you like, farmers out of rural areas to urban dwellings and to urban occupations. India also uh, has been talking about building the 100 smart cities with a part of the same vision. Now this view of agrarian transition is of course bolstered by arguments that poverty is much less in urban areas than rural areas and rapid urbanization will rapidly reduce poverty. A somewhat mechanistic sort of connection. Now the costs of such shifts, which all of us know, water scarcity, urban waste, pollution, limited housing, crime, up, uh, unemployment, family separations, and so on, are seldom factored in. Nor is the fact that a growing urban population will need that those who are continuing to farm have to produce ever-increasing surpluses. So this is the first view. Now this is the second view. Now the second view is that, um, is that uh, small farmers are drivers of growth. They are central for ensuring food security, for mitigating climate change, for preserving biodiversity. Now within this view, of course, there's a range of um, ways of thinking about this, and some see smallholders as necessary for smoothing the transition uh, to non-farm jobs over time, and others see agroecological farming um, as, and closeness to nature as a sort of long-term alternative to the travails of city life. I did choose those pictures as contrasting ones. <laughs> now, an important variation of the latter perspective, which emphasizes national and local self-sufficiency as the key to food security, is being artic articulated by social movements. And in particular is the global food sovereignty movement, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, um, which some of you would be familiar with, which is constituted of diverse individuals and civil society. Now both views, as I have mentioned, raise a common ethical concern. How much autonomy and how much voice do smallholders themselves have in deciding their farming practices? To what extent are their preferences and their choices taken into account by governments and movements that chart out their futures? Now you might say, well, such a concern is of course not surprising if you're talking about state-driven initiatives. But it is somewhat surprising in relation to social movements, since movements are supposed to take account of choices and voices <coughs> of those they represent. 
Yet we find uh, that the whole issue of representation in social movements is really mired with problems, especially when arguments and demands that arise from specific contexts are presented globally on behalf of people who are living in vastly different circumstances. Now, one of the most widely influential of these is the food sovereignty movement, which is catalyzed by Via Campesina, and that's a case in point. It's constituted of 148 organizations across 69 countries. But if you actually um, look at its composition, then you find that its members are quite heterogeneous, and in many regions they have rather limited representation among um, the poorest farmers. Now this movement argues for self-sufficiency in food production, both nationally and locally. It emphasizes food diversity, organic farming, peasant control over the food chain and over land. And in terms of processes, there is a particular emphasis on social equity, consensus building, and democratic choice. So you might say, wow, well, those are really attractive goals. And indeed they are. But they contain contradictions. So for instance, if you take the goal of national self-sufficiency. Now we know it becomes attractive for many countries in the wake of the 2007-8 world food price hike and global dependency. So for instance, if you look at this chart, you notice that um, Asia produces the largest percentage of the world's cereals. Um, I, don't, I think this doesn't actually link with this. Um, but um, it is also the largest net importer. So you know, you just look at this and we find that these are imports and these are production. And uh, this next, next slide is uh, uh, more specific. You can see the regional imbalances where um, most of the developing com developed countries are exporters, net exporters, and the developing countries are next import uh, net importers um, of uh, cereals. Taking all the major cereals, rice, wheat, maize, and so on. Um, so, so, in a sense, if you talk about national self-sufficiency, it becomes attractive. But in practical terms, of course, it is easier to think of national self-sufficiency if you're thinking of large countries like China, India, Brazil, and Nigeria, than for small countries who have rather limited arable land and uh, which remain highly dependent on cereal imports. Also, uh, local self-sufficiency isn't the answer to global dependencies. Now this goal of the food sovereignty movement raises the most questions, not only because there are resource constraints, but also because of the issue of democratic choice. Do smallholders the world over want to grow food, crop, food crops organically produced? In fact, many farmers may choose not to farm or to grow food crops or to farm organically. So for instance, in 2003, in India there was a nationwide survey of 51,000 farmers 0.29 million persons, which found that 40% said they did not like farming. And if they had other options, they would prefer another occupation. So who were these people? Those dislike, disliking farming, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can actually see it, I hope so. Uh, otherwise, you don't have to take my word for it. <laughs> so those disliking farmers op operated much smaller plots than those liking farming. farming. Um, they also are less likely to be aware of the government's minimum support prices, to have crop insurance, to be members of a farmer's organization, or know about biofertilizers. In short, the more vulnerable and resource poor are the most likely to want to leave agriculture, perhaps not surprisingly. Also importantly, women and younger people, significantly more than men and older people, expressed a dislike for farming. Now, you know, there is this very popular assumption that women love farming, they like to grow food crops. But, as you can see, in fact, if you think about it, it's understandable that they might dislike farming because they have excessive work burdens, they do unpaid labor on farms, <coughs> and they have serious resource constraints. But this, of course, is also a cause for concern in terms of global food security, given the feminization of agriculture, on which I'll just say a few more words in a minute. Similarly, if you think of younger people disliking farming and they are the better educated members, then it portends rather, um, it portends declining human capital in agriculture. So again, there should be a cause for concern. Now, my own research on women's group farming in South India, for instance, shows that farmers 
um, uh, facing difficult choices often prefer to grow non-food crops. So for instance, uh, I've been studying uh, women's groups who've been doing group farming, collective farming, pooling their resources, who've stopped cultivating. And when you ask them why, they say because the local NGO, is not the government, the local NGO, which had catalyzed group formation, had mandated that food crops should be grown by them to enhance food security, which is similar to the food sovereignty argument. But the food crops often failed under drought conditions, and what the women wanted to grow was cotton, if allowed the freedom to, to choose. So here are just some quotations. Um, I'll just read out um, bits of one or two. Um, so in one case, they say, the NGO has laid the condition that we cultivate only food crops, but we have to pay a high lease rent um, for the land. Maize needs water. Without rains, we lost the entire crop. If they permit us to grow cotton, we would continue to farming since we, since we would then recover the cost of the investment. Then there's another one that says, we want more profits from agriculture. The, the NGO staff restricted us to food crops because there were no rains for the third year running. We only cultivated pulses in two acres and got no yield. Then we decided to go into individual farming, grow cotton, which allows us more profit when the rains fail. So, so here's, I mean, this, this actually goes on, and these are just some illustrations. The popular assumption that women, women prefer food crops is questionable, that they're not interested in profits is questionable. And this, of course, we know is true not just for South Asia, but there's, of course, a substantial amount of evidence for sub-Saharan Africa and also Latin America, that women do very well on commercial crops as well. So even with the best of intentions, you can have NGOs and social movements ending up by promoting pathways to food security, which are contrary to what the farmers themselves want, given their constraints. And similarly, one can argue about low chemical farming, which we know, of course, is very important for environmental purposes and for human health, but it's not everyone's sole choice. So I just looked up the figures in the 213 world of organic agriculture and found that in India, only 0.6% of agricultural land was under certified organic production. The figure for China was 0.36%, for Brazil, 0.27%. Of course, one can argue that most poor farmers, including those in India, are organic by default because they can't afford chemicals. But it's not our choice. And this is despite policies of governments to promote low chemical farming. So, choosing not to farm for self-sufficiency, choosing not to grow food crops, choosing not to grow organically, these are all democratic choices. But they go contrary to the vision of self -suff local self-sufficiency, as espoused by many social movements, including significant ones like the food sovereignty movement. So the absence of voice and choice raises central ethical issues, whether the context is state-instituted mechanisms that propel or force rural people into cities, all the mechanisms are initiated by social movements which give primacy to growing your own food for nutritional security irrespective of circumstance. But of course, choice itself is a complex issue. Choices can be restricted by a range of factors, economic and social. And the majority of farmers, as I had mentioned, in developing countries are small, they are marginal, and they are increasingly women. So 80% of farmers cultivate under two hectares. Most of them are trapped in low productivity cycles. And there is a feminization of agriculture, particularly in Asia and Africa, where women constitute a large, large uh, increasing proportion of um, far, farm workers as more men than women move to non-farm jobs. So if you take, uh, take this um, slide, uh, as you can see, the slightly upward slope shows the move towards um, uh, having more women than men uh, in the total agricultural workforce. So, in, in, and if you disaggregate this, and I have it in a number of papers, is that if you take the world's major rice producing and exporting regions of Asia, almost half the agricultural workforce is female, and the same is true for Africa. But small farmers in general, and women farmers in, in particular, are seriously restricted in their access to land, to water, to credit, to technology, to fertilizers, to information, and to marketing. So just some figures for land. 
um, it's an area I've worked on a lot and, and it's, it's a, still a grand capital production. Just any figures here will indicate Nepal, 14% of households have women only gland. Uh, India, we don't have aggregate figures, but 12.8% of women operating land in their own right. Uh, only 12 of uh, only 12.8 percent of households have women operating land in their own right. If we take Africa, five percent in Kenya registered landholders are women. Ghana, 10 percent, and so on. You know there are there are some countries which are closer. Botswana, for instance, does well. But in general, we find that land is a seriously um, it has a serious gender bias in in terms of access. Um, and, uh, and of course, there are biases in all the other interrelated aspects that I talked about on production inputs. Now, in the absence of such inputs, it is possible that small farmers who are today saying they want to leave farming, they dislike farming, could choose differently, at least in the short term. So, for instance, uh, one of the assessments that was made by the FAO's 2011 State of Agriculture report uh, which drew upon a wide range of econometrically sophisticated studies, especially for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, assessed that women farmers, if they had the same access to inputs and services as men, their crop yields could be raised by 20 to 30 percent, and agricultural production could increase globally by 2 to 4 percent. So the <coughs> sovereignty movement emphasizes a farmer's right to be self-sufficient, but not the constraints that she might face to achieve that goal. So an obvious question will be, well, how do we reduce these constraints? How do we broaden their choices? And there are no easy answers, uh, because many of the constraints stem from deep structural inequalities, especially in the distribution of land and other assets, which in turn influence your access to other inputs, and it influences your political voice. For women farmers, of course, there are additional constraints, and uh, there's, a, there's a note out there I wrote for this project, which is on perception bias and social norms. So delivery agencies see women as farm wives and not full-fledged farmers, and they bypass them. And social norms restrict women's mobility in many regions and market interactions in many countries. So these standard pathways that people talk about of higher investment in infrastructure, better input delivery to increase small farm incomes and outputs, uh, which are clearly important, may prove insufficient if smallholders cannot access the infrastructure that is created. And so here is where I take a leap and I say, well, let's look at institutional innovations. We talk a lot about technology and we talk a lot about finances and about infrastructure. And one of the possibilities is an innovation which I call a group approach to farming as an alternative to the widespread model of individual family farms or the emerging model of large corporate farms. And this is an area I'm currently researching. Now a group approach in agriculture could take many forms, uh, some of which you might actually be quite familiar with even in the United States. You know, you, um, what I call minimal form of cooperation, you come into cooperatives, you market your produce together, um, and they are producer companies for, for uh, also emerging uh, for marketing. Milk is a very, dairy is a very important form of cooperatives that you see globally, uh, including and particularly in Scandinavian countries. But also in countries like India, where this is one of the most successful dairy cooperatives, there's more than 2.5 million members, most with very small uh, animal owners. They carry them with their every day and get a good price for it. Um, however, um, the, you know, the fact is that uh, marketing cooperatives require rather little cooperation. And you basically have to produce and then you take it to the market. Um, a somewhat higher level of cooperation can be found uh, in terms of what I call uh, single purpose medium cooperation, which is you jointly invest in private irrigation. The historical examples which go back a uh, few hundred years at least in India and elsewhere uh, in Asia. Um, and then there are machine cooperatives. You, know, you find interesting examples from Canada to France on this, which is you don't have to own your large lumpy inputs like machinery, you simply lease them in, but you do it through a cooperative. But then um, the, the point is that perhaps we can discuss a much more multipurpose, what I call, there can be limited multipurpose cooperation. And this is, this is 
gaining some traction now. You know, people are talking about landscape planning. Let's <coughs> farmers come together and across regions look at watersheds, look at um, where the resources are, and let's plan it so that you don't grow sugar cane in, in water scarce areas or rice. I mean, you, you, you do it much more rationally and so on. And then you have what I call multi-purpose comprehensive cooperation, where you actually pool your land and your resources. You don't lose your property rights over them, so they're not like the socialist collectives. Uh, they're bottom-up and voluntary, and you can have an integrated form of cooperation. Now, potentially, there can be many advantages of this. One is simply pulling your land together, removing your boundaries, increases your arable land. There can be economies of scale. You can have labor sharing and labor saving. You have better access to a range of inputs. The better access comes because if you are a substantial body rather than individual small farms, you have more bargaining power with markets where government institutions. There's great better potential for risk sharing, greater diversity of skills and knowledge, greater, you know, land grabbing again is something which is talked about a lot where a number of countries uh, have China, India, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Sweden, uh, are, are taking land and investing um, in other countries where they are land scarce. Um, but you can resist that if you like, as small farmers, if you are a cooperative or a group. And then better adaptation to climate change, particularly as we know that uh, aspects to deal for mitigating and adap adapting climate change, you actually need group approaches. You can't just conserve forests and water systems and, uh, and so on without cooperation across uh, communities. <clears throat> and, and, and larger units. Uh, so, uh, potentially there are a lot of advantages. Now, of course, I can't persuade you simply by saying, well, this is a great idea. So, does it exist on the ground? It does. And there are some interesting examples in Asia and Europe which suggest that such cooperation is possible. Uh, these groups are voluntarily formed. They involve pooling land and resources in varying degree, but without, as I said, forfeiting their property rights. So in, particularly I found such groups in Central Asia and Europe um, and also in, in, in India. Now in Central Asia and Europe, you find that many of these groups uh, emerged after decollectivization of agriculture. So for instance, in Romania, East Germany, Kyrgyzstan, um, you, you find this happening. And uh, what's interesting is that studies done show that the productivity on group farms in, is found to be um, higher than on individual farms. So here's an example of uh, cooperative in Romania. In South Asia, on the examples that I'm researching, there are women-only groups, and they are catalyzed by NGOs, and in some cases by local government. They usually lease in their land collectively, they do organic farming, and crop diversification. But there's a mixed bag. In some regions, as in Andhra Pradesh, if you see peninsular part of India, there's Andhra Pradesh. Um, the NGO-promoted groups are restricted to food crops, you know, the example I've given earlier. Um, but in some cases, this has led to crop diversification, which is a good thing. This is a woman preserving 24 varieties of seeds. Great for biodiversity. But sometimes they're less successful, and I, I suspect my results will, will show that. Uh, in economic terms, um, and so uh, as, as compared to, hang on, this, this slide should, yeah, okay. Uh, they're less successful than another example from India, which is in, in the southernmost tip, uh, where you have Kerala. And here you find that women are not restricted to um, food crops. They are allowed, they, they cultivate whatever it is, suits them for home use and for market use. And here they are growing bitter gout. There's a group of, a small group of uh, five or six women, each group has that. They, they lease in their land, <coughs> they're doing very good marketing. This particular group had actually purchased through their profits a truck, uh, which they uh, took to market. Now, uh, they are small in size in terms of individual groups, but large in number. There are 34,000 such groups in, across the state. And we can talk about scale issues. And they're using modern technology. So here's very interesting. There are two regions. This is Andhra Pradesh, where they're using traditional technology. And here, they are happily <coughs> using modern uh, technology, using tractors, which they lease in um, from uh, the machine cooperative in which also the local government uh, has uh, set up. They do do organic farming. I mean, those pictures of the bitter gouts where they, they use um, ways of trapping insects using honey and other things. 
um, which are quite impressive. Now, in here, the farmers, um, so here we can see that uh, food security uh, may be seen as achievable not only by growing what, what you eat, but through higher incomes by growing non food crops. <coughs> they, uh, they grow a bunch of different things. Uh, here, they're growing, they may be growing paddy, but they also may be growing bananas and bitter gourds and vegetables. Um, so the, the, these are the principles which I have culled out of many of these cases, um, which I think are extremely important in, in relation to our discussion of democratic choice. The groups are voluntary in nature, they're small in size. And the, the others are principles which we know from collective action literature is what makes a group work. We know from, from self-help groups and credit groups across the world, small size matters, socioeconomic homogeneity matters. They have their participatory in decision making, so people have a voice. For instance, they might meet once a week, and, and if somebody doesn't turn up for work, they say, but why didn't you turn up for work? You know everybody in the village, you know why and what, and how do you take account of it? Then they, so that's checks on free riding, which is a standard concern that economists in particular have, because they assume that the only thing that, that motivates us, us is self-interest. If that's the case, of course, you free ride. Uh, however, there are com even that, there is an answer, so the communities can take care of it if they're watching you, for instance. And there's fair and transparent distribution of production benefits. Okay, so um, now, uh, as I said also, that um, uh, the collective management of public goods, um, it, I haven't, my previous book was looking at community forestry, also works better in groups, of course, because um, you, and, and you have very similar sorts of principles that emerge. Those of you who are familiar with Ellen Ostrom, the Nobel laureate, um, who was a political scientist who won the Economics Prize a few years ago, uh, she extracted a set of principles for what makes um, a group's work a successful and enduring uh, 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 governing the commons. Um, so, so what these examples suggest is there's a scope for developing a range of institutional arrangements to empower the small holder. And of course, how such arrangements may emerge, how they sustain, of course, requires more probing, and this is something I hope to contribute to. Um, but what I can say even now is that a mix of economic incentives, mutual interdependence, and civil society initiation. Importantly, though, these initiatives did not arise from a global vision of what peasants should do or be. They arose from local visions and support systems. So global visions not only lack context specificity, they also raise issues of representation. Who represents the many, by what processes are decisions taken? So I'm not against global visions, but the importance that they be contextualized, so that people can have a voice and have choice. The challenge is to create conditions which bridge the gaps between individual freedoms and social goals. So then I come to a really difficult question, which I pose to myself, by the way, which is, will individual choice lead to socially desirable outcomes? How can we bring about a convergence between individual autonomy and global responsibility for environmentally sustainable food production? Now again, there are no easy answers, but I did want to put here four aspects which I, into this basket, <coughs> aspects which I think um, could be central. And all of these are ways of directing choice without coercion. And that's of course important. So one is of course persuasion through information and argument. Um, making people aware of the goods and bads of, say, chemical farming or overdrawing on scarce groundwater and so on. Now, persuasion through information can firstly appeal to people's moral responsibilities. You might say, well, you know, chemical agriculture is bad for the planet's future, but also for future generations. Like, you know, smoking is bad not just for you, but also your neighbors and your pet canary. Um, but also, um, it can appeal to enlightened self-interest. So if you have excessive pesticides, it severely damages health of your children. And you see that happening, you know, when water tables fall um, hugely, then you, they hit um, all sorts of elements, arsenic, and in, in the breadbasket of India, Northwest India, in the Punjab, you find that already happening, which is really tragic, um, uh, that uh, children are being born deformed. 
So here the farmers would have a self-interest in going organic. But persuasion through information, of course, assumes that people don't do what they should do because they don't know enough. But many may know and cannot afford to act on that information. So I believe economic incentives are important. And when I think of economic incentives, you think of both positive and negative. Uh, positive, you say subsidize good practice. Negative, you penalize bad practice. All sorts of taxes, for instance. And then there are other methods, perhaps. Peer demand to tackle negative externalities. Um, everybody here would know about that, of course, and would have written much more than I would imagine. When your actions harm others, others object to your continuing with the practice. If you pollute the groundwater with chemical pesticides, your neighbors will suffer and hopefully they'll pressure you to stop. And then peer demonstration of the possibilities of alternatives. And here I believe that a critical mass of people who choose an alternative pathway could demonstrate to others what is possible. And here's, here's the possibility, therefore. So if you have groups which are, which are adopting uh, low chemical farming, it would be much more effective <coughs> than simply individuals. And that's how, of course, diffusion of ideas, diffusion of innovation takes place, that people demonstrate that it's effective, and then others adopt it. So um, in conclusion, whether you're promoted by the state or by civil society, achieving food security ethically and sustainably will require the creation of conditions wherein farmers can exercise options that they bear value. Some may choose to transit out of agriculture gradually or grow non-food crops, and others may choose to stay and choose otherwise. But the less constrained are their choices by structural inequalities, by lack of access to essential inputs, or by ideological pressures defining the right path, the more strongly can we defend the solutions on ethical grounds. I'm making this clear, of course. At the same time, we also need to find ways by which individual choices converge toward and not diverge from environmentally sustainable solutions. And therein lies the challenge and the road ahead. Thank you. That's excellent. We have 15 minutes for uh, questions and comments. I can we make sure that you, you guys in uh, at size maybe can unmute yourselves too at this point if you want to wave or something so that we know when you want to ask a question. Okay, so we'll get to Deborah in a second, and, and first we'll do Holly Taylor here in, in Baltimore. Hi there. So speak um, up so we can. Uh, yeah. So on your second to last slide, those two, the, the third and fourth um, slides in your case studies to date, whether in telling the story, it seems to me like three and four are what's working in the, just the examples that you gave, that they are, you know, sort of patrolling each other and then showing by example, or are there other ways in which one and two are playing a role? Um, in fact, one is playing quite a lot, like one in, one in four actually play uh, significant roles. Um, one in terms of, you know, when I, when I talk about information, it's really underlying that one could broaden it to say training. Um, so uh, it's not like you don't want to use, let's say, uh, non-chemical yeah. fertilizer, uh, sure. uh, uh, pesticides, but you need to be, uh, give some amount of information on how that could be done effectively. And once that training is given, it's very interesting that, uh, for instance, the Kerala example, the state government provides that training, and it provides it to the women's groups. But because many of these uh, women in these groups also have uh, family farms, the information has spills over to their family farms, and they begin to use that. So uh, in a way, the diffusion of this idea um, happens uh, not just across between farms, but also between uh, different categories of, of farms. And of course, we know that there are positive externalities uh, um, in in in, uh, in pest control in any case, uh, which, are, which are very important. So that so it's a critical mass of it's information persuasion and uh, demonstration through a critical mass. Thanks. So Deborah, did you want to ask? So maybe yeah, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, we can hear you. Fine. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks, Bina. That was fascinating. Um, 
this is always an interesting setup for how we engage remotely. But um, I, I thought also I wanted to talk about that second uh, to last slide. And it seems that, um, I haven't done this kind of research myself, but it's, it seems to set, uh, it seems to lend itself very well to something like, you know, this popular randomized controlled trial experiments, looking at um, doing something where you would have more controls. And I don't know if you're adopting this uh, method at all in the project, but uh, it does seem kind of exciting that you could experiment with those different methods, perhaps. So that would be a, maybe a bigger thing or more involved than you'd want to be. But I wonder what your, your thoughts are about uh, that kind of approach and how that might work to uh, answer at least, you know, with a, a degree of rigor, which is always pro or con. Uh, there are debates about, about how useful they are. But this kind of question, which is a, a big policy question, doesn't always get um, addressed with that experimental method. So I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Um, thank you. No, my, uh, the, the groups I'm studying are already in place. So, um, you know, you can't actually bring in an RCT um, methodology. Um, into these groups because um, my interest is not just studying the technical aspects of farming but also um, studying whether the groups work better in terms of overall productivity than individual farms. Um, however, uh, it, would be a, uh, it would be a methodology that uh, could be very much applied to the second which is economic incentives. Um, uh, I think that would be the easiest in which you can apply a randomized control trial um, in which you can, you can introduce certain kinds of economic incentives, negative or positive, in, with one population and, and, and not with another. It's more difficult when you have diffuse processes like um, institutions and a demonstration effect, uh, simply because the process of diffusion takes a, range, uh, a level of time. And RCTs don't work so well in, in looking at institutional change, to my understanding. So, yes, definitely, I think. There's something else which I was thinking of, I haven't, you know, I'm discussing this with some colleagues, is to see whether um, if you actually do um, a randomized control uh, trial in terms of farmers' fields. So, one of the issues that has come up is that uh, the, 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 when new technology is diffused and you do the experiment in the farmer's field, um, the farmer is able to pick up more. Now, it would be interesting to gender that and see whether, especially in the, in the, in the African context, to see male farmers and women farmers uh, uh, and, and try those out and see whether that makes a difference. And, um, so there, there's a whole range of things by which, yes, uh, we could use our cities. There are also limitations, as you know, of our cities. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for that great presentation. Um, I guess my question is about the other side of the coin, which is the large business farming, and whether there are incentive structures or whether it's necessary to bring in incentive structures to incentivize or disincentivize people going from small to large or staying in the large farming uh, side of it. Is there a role for large farming? If so, if not, then how do we go push people back towards more small? Well, if, you're going to, if you have a large farm, you're not going to push people back, but, uh, but I will answer that second part. Uh, in as a second. Um, the, the first is that uh, the idea of a group, when you're talking about uh, cooperation across farms, is that ownership is not necessarily the unit of production. Now, if we tend to think of ownership as the unit of production, then all these are very small farms when we talk about small villages. But when you cooperate, you actually become a medium or a, or a you know, larger than medium farm. Um, 2.5 million cooperatives for market is, is, is a very large unit. Um, you have landscape planning, and that's, that's, that can be quite large. Mm -hmm. So the idea uh, is that does a cooperation enable you to be small in ownership, but large in production? And the advantage of that can also be precisely that you link up with higher value chains. If you look at at least some of the literature that I've looked at, and Deborah is, of course, uh, the expert on this, uh, but uh, on uh, contract farming, for instance, uh, I was struck, you're always struck by the fact that the contract farming, uh, the companies don't go to the really small farmers because small farmers can't take the risk, they're not crop insured, uh, etc. You can't guarantee quality. But if you have groups of farmers, 
linked up with the contracts, then it is possible for them to get crop insurance, to share their risks and deliver. So I think the possibilities of small farmers linking up and getting advantage of what the large farmers have commercially increase hugely if you, if you, if you, if you, if you have a, a more cooperation um, uh, driven approach. Um, but just briefly on your, on your other point, which is that the only example where I know where large is becoming small uh, is as a result of social movement, the MST in Brazil, for instance, um, where you have in the constitution that land should be used for social purpose. So you have a fair amount of land which has been redistributed to the small holders, and they are promoting agroecology. Uh, there are farms about 15 hectares that I've seen. I, I visited one of the London districts and so on. Um, and that's quite impressive. So that's very interesting. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for that talk. Um, I, I, in listening to you, I think of um, probably an incorrect term, but entrenched culture. Uh, in, it plays an important role in how to overcome entrenched cultural values with innovation. Uh, in, in Kerala, uh, for example, Kerala varies in many ways from India because it's matrilineal and it, there's, a, there's a dominance of, of maternal culture in Kerala that I think probably helps to shape some of those innovations. On the other hand, if you go to the Chirai of Nepal, uh, the, the role of the woman is, is you know, traditionally low and subjugated. And despite agricultural innovations in the southern part of the country, where you have you know, fertilizer and new kinds of seeds and irrigation and lot, everything that you're supposed to do correctly uh, is going on in the tribe of Nepal. But, it is food insecure, it is the most malnourished part of the country, and you see this, this dissociation uh, there that is not taking hold of the assets to help food security in that region. What links that together for me is what I've seen in Bangladesh, where education of the girl has been pushed like crazy by the government for the past 15 to 18 years. And we're seeing more women educated than men we're seeing, and you know, it's sort of something you can't get your hands around. It's hard to hard to attribute cause, but you see improvements in rural Bangladesh with respect to more fish on the plate, more more variety. And I can't help but think that there's a there's a role there for the innovation of maternal education uh, to drive food food equality, food security in in rural Bangladesh. And finally, one other innovation that strikes me in the past 20 years is something that the villagers can gather around like a tube, like a, 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 um, a borehole, you know, a, a cheap Chinese engine to put onto a bar, borehole that can flood a field and irrigate fields that families can come around. That seems to equalize the ability to, 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 for families to, to care for themselves and for their local markets. So, I, I think of you know, the entrenched cultures and what innovations can be put on top of those cultures to change them in modern times. And could you reflect on some of those ideas, uh, you know, women's education and local innovations that can take off? Um, no, that's very good. I, uh, I can reflect on it, <laughs> <laughs> certainly. Um, of course, women's education is, is, is intrinsically important, and it's also, as you say, instrumentally important. Uh, particularly in the context of maternal health, child care, reduction of fertility, degree of autonomy in, in, in controlling your own bodies. You know, there's a lot of feminist literature on there as well, which totally supports um, what you're saying. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, then uh, let me add a couple of things. Um, one is that, uh, take Kerala. Now, Kerala has 96% female literacy. It is it has been so for a very long period of time, historically latter part of the 19th century, the state has been pushing female education. Only 35% of Kerala's population ever was matrilineal. Uh, although social norms um, are wider, more women friendly um, than simply the matrilineal population, nevertheless it never exceeded more than a certain proportion. Uh, <clears throat> now, despite all of this, 
you didn't have, um, it, what was paradoxical about Kerala is that you, you in fact uh, have quite low levels of women's participation in the labor force. Um, and so it wasn't automatic that you had women's education would lead you towards this form of innovation. Um, the innovation, however, did take off. Some of it you could say is because of education, but it's taken off in Andhra also where education is meant less. So I think education is extremely important, but um, not a sufficient condition, and sometimes perhaps not even an adequate necessary condition for uh, the innovation. This broadens our field of innovation, if you like. Um, Bangladesh is a very interesting case because alongside pushing female education, uh, you had a lot of experiments with groups. So there's a Grameen Bank from 1972 onwards, uh, forming a formation of self-help groups. There's uh, BRAC, the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, which uh, not only promoted female education, I mean hundreds and hundreds of primary schools, but it pushed women to work together in groups. I was very struck by some of the ethnography where women would say, um, you know, would challenge the local clergy. Social norms were such that if you went out to work, it was considered shameful. And they would argue back saying, isn't it shameful if my child dies uh, hungry? Um, so uh, the, the, why is it that the local clergy have one set of norms for the rich and another for the poor? So they were able to challenge these social norms. And, uh, and I argue in, in a previous book that um, it's the mix of this, which is a group approach, their ability to find work outside the home so that the husbands would support them. Uh, and, uh, and yes, certainly I think uh, the fact that simultaneous clean education, so it's, it's a cluster of advantage, if you like, which plays out. Um, Nepal is, does badly on that, it's a cluster of disadvantage on all those fronts. Uh, and one final thing I'd like to throw in, that assets matter. So Kerala is, so, you know, if you look at, um, historically, if you look at South Asia, and ownership of land. Um, I want to bring in a country which is very rarely talked about, which is Sri Lanka. Now Sri Lanka, if you look at South Asia, and you can even compare it to China, it does very well on maternal mortality, on infant, infant mortality is very low, it has um, the female literacy which is extremely high, and it historically, at least you can trace it back to the 16th century onwards, that women have had rights in landed property. And, and similarly for Kerala. So I think there is a missing variable here, which we need to factor in. Sure. I thank you very much for the, for the great talk. I was going to ask you to um, say a little bit more about um, both intra-group and uh, intergroup uh, dynamics. And, and so for the intergroup, kind of, I'm interested in maybe asymmetries of, of intergroup bargaining. This so for the various members, maybe some bring larger or better positioned, uh, or even better staffed, small farms, so a larger family. Um, you know, what, what secures kind of fairness of bargaining um, between the farms within a group? And, and if the farms themselves have the opportunity to go into other groups, they have a choice among the groups they could join, um, how, does, how does that play out uh, in terms of making sure that each of the groups does well um, and that others are not at some sort of a disadvantage? And I was going to, the last part of that is, is what place do, say, sharecroppers or wage workers have within these larger groups? Is it, is it all landowners who are sort of providing the labor, or and if so, what well, then what does become a potential the folks who might otherwise be sharecroppers or wage laborers? Thank you. Those really great questions. Um, on the last one, I mean the um, the advantage of say a group approach is that you don't have to own land. Um, you can be and in fact <coughs> um, in most of these groups lease in land, so they may have small bits of land which they cultivate with their families, but they lease in land. And so effectively, that could be a sharecropping arrangement or it could be a, it was a cash rent arrangement. Most of them these days have moved to cash rent. It's rather rare to have sharecropping. Uh, nevertheless, it's rented land. And uh, looking at the profiles, I've collected the profiles of all these cases of who constitutes the group. And everything from what they own to marital status to dependency ratios and so on. And just, uh, I still haven't analyzed it, but um, it, many of them contain landless. Uh, farmers. So it provides them a basis. They bring in their labor um, and they're able to work, but they don't necessarily have to bring in uh, uh, capital or, uh, or land. So it provides a possibility, which is in addition to wage labor. Mm -hmm. 
and, and therefore is a protection for many of them and a, a source of food security as well because if when you distribute the crop then some part they keep for home use and they can take them, take it home. Uh, it also improves their possibilities in the wage market because we know from other literature that uh, those who have access to a bit of land actually have more bargaining power in the, in the labor market, in the wage labor market. Um, there's a lot of work by Chris Satt, uh, and, and others which, show, which shows that. Uh, Intergroup bargaining, um, this, well, the, one is of course bargaining with the state, with markets and so on, which a group is, the argument is that the group will be better than individuals. Um, what, you know, what is very important, and perhaps this is where the collective action theory comes in, is that you need some degree of trust and reciprocity in, in, for the group to function. Um, it's not just economic um, benefits, but for them, for the everyday interaction. And um, the way some of these groups are set up in both these examples that I'm studying, in Kerala, it's, they first form neighborhood groups. So they know each other, and that's the, that's the foundation. And then they come together. So they live next to, next to each other. It's wonderful in their ability to actually negotiate in the land market. They often get land at lower than market prices because they, 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 they're known in the community. So um, the, the inter, uh, so the, you, you don't, you know, you may dissolve as a group and reform, but uh, it doesn't happen that often. You pretty much stay with the group. Sometimes groups dissolve as well. Intra-group uh, bargaining uh, can be viewed in a variety of ways. I mean, I've written about it a lot in terms of intra-family bargaining between the genders. And from the initial results, I haven't formalized it, it's extremely difficult, you need a different study for that. But they are able to bargain, um, both with the community, in terms of self-respect, in terms of access to inputs, and with their husbands. In, because now they're seen as farmers. And there are times when the men move out, and the women continue to cultivate, uh, and actually become the major, major farmer in the family. So I think it helps on bargaining on all those counts. We have to stop, unfortunately, given that hour. But that was uh, fascinating. I think everybody would agree. For being here, thank you uh, to our colleagues at Precise for co-sponsoring with us and being able to see us and talk to us. <laughs>